Okay. Hello. Hi, Lindsay. I'm very happy. I'll let you have a glass of water because uh, you're going to be doing a lot of talking. <laughs> I'm very happy to be able to talk to Lindsay Dow of Lindsay Does Languages. And maybe you can start by explaining what it is that you do. Ah, okay. Thank you very much, Steve. Hello. Uh, so I'm Lindsay, as you've said. And so what I do is quite a mixture of things. I teach languages. I teach English, French and Spanish, uh, but I also learn them myself. That's that's my main passion is the learning side of things. Um, right now, I'm learning Korean and trying to keep up a little bit of Japanese as well. And I recently actually finished Esperanto on Duolingo, which is which is uh, quite interesting because I started it a lot later than those languages, yet I feel so much more advanced already, which goes to show the whole no language is created equal theory <laughs> uh, for the learner. But yeah, I also, on Lindsay Does Languages, I blog, I make videos about language. It's pretty much everything uh -huh. in, we, my, in my life. Language, we, language, language. Okay, we'll leave a link in the description box here to the video so people can cool. uh, come and visit you. Um, now, question. First of all, l let me say that uh, having learned a bunch of languages, that languages are not equal equal in terms of their level of difficulty, as you say. And it all yes. depends on the language we start from. But I'm finding Korean a challenge. Even though I speak Chinese and I speak Japanese, Korean is difficult. And we can get into that later on, perhaps in the discussion. What makes a language difficult? And no question that after Russian and uh, Czech, then Ukrainian becomes easier. Uh, for French speakers, Spanish speakers, so they're not all equally difficult, no question. But my, my question is this, I think we have a tendency to think of English speaking countries as countries where, and that includes of course the UK, Canada and so forth, countries where people are less interested in learning other languages, either because they're less intelligent, which is probably not the case, <laughs> most people are equally intelligent on average, or because they just don't feel the need. Whereas people in countries, and typically people from smaller countries, uh, from smaller languages feel an, a greater need to learn and if you go to Japan or Russia or I don't know Spain mind you the Germans are pretty good so the question is this how keen are people in the UK on learning languages is a big part of your job trying to mot motivate them or are there a lot of motivated people who just need your help that's a very good question and it's something I always thought of from the beginning is I mean, when I, before I did Lindsay Does Languages, I worked in a secondary school um, and I was a learner support assistant, primarily in the language department. And I would take out small groups um, to teach them, you know, if, if they kind of wouldn't pick up as much in the class, we teach them at a summer rate by myself. Um, and it was always a challenge in the sense that within the main classroom, within the main language classroom in secondary school, and bear in mind, this is a lot of the time, this was the first exposure people had had to languages. In primary school, when I was working in, in, in schools, it wasn't compulsory. I think it was in 2014, they actually made it compulsory to learn a language in primary school. And it's a very interesting thing is that it's actually very open. They say any language, living or dead, they have to learn a language, a, a different language to English within primary school, which is really interesting because it then creates this this difference that you have then when people then go to secondary school and they start with generally French or Spanish, occasionally German, maybe something else. And, and it was the same problem when I was at that age as well. I'd had French club in primary school um, as a kind of extracurricular thing. But then going to secondary school, you start from the beginning because you're coming from all these different feeder schools and no one knows where you're at and and so the teachers then have this quite difficult job granted of, of trying to bring everyone to the same point. But the problem, what happens there is you're 11 years old and your teachers are talking to you as if you're four. They're, you know, they're dog, cat, green, blue, all of that stuff. And it's taught in a very primary manner, very simplistic. You know, you go into math lesson and you're learning kind of trigonometry for the first time. And then in French, you're still learning... I like football. And I think that's a big reason um, is, is the sort of education side of things, this, you know, the kind of um, official education side of things is that it's not very inspiring, perhaps. And that's by no means the fault of teachers. There's some fantastic language teachers out there. But then also, as you say, coming from an English-speaking country, 
country where the need is seen as less. You know, a and couple so, of... Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say a couple of reactions. If you're in Sweden, most kids, by the time they reach secondary school, they already speak English because they've been watching uh, English language television programs, English language movies, listening to English pop music yep. and so forth. So, and, and another thing too is I often question the, you know, the relative importance of the classroom versus other factors. And yeah. I'll give you another example. Uh, my grandchildren are in French immersion. French immersion huh. in Canada is a situa situation where English-speaking kids in a place like Vancouver, where there's no fr French speakers to speak of, they do all their schooling in French. The late immersion kids who start in grade 7 or grade 8, they catch up right away. So they're in a classroom studying, you know, history, chemistry, whatever it might be, maybe getting a little extra help, but they're doing everything in French. And they're in there with a group of kids who started doing this from grade one, and they catch up right away. So, so yeah. it, it's interesting. So it gets back to your point. Maybe in high school in Britain, instead of teaching them this is a dog, if they actually gave them something that was more challenging to do and more interesting, they might advance more quickly. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I, re I, I completely agree with that. I mean, like I mentioned briefly, the, the, now it's compulsory in primary school and it's very open. And they'll say, you know, you learn a language. So you primarily it's going to be French. It's going to be Spanish. Um, but, you know, you've got companies that will, go, that will teach. There's one company, I think they're called Springboard to Languages, and they teach Esperanto. And their whole kind of ethos is, well, in primary school, kids learn the recorder, not to create a nation of recorder players, but to create kids that understand the basics of music. And, you know, they teach Esperanto with that mindset of this isn't so that everyone speaks Esperanto. It's so that people are exposed and from a young age to other languages. And I think that is what's needed. And that is hopefully what's now beginning to change in the last couple of years with that introduction. Now, question. If the kids in primary school can choose any language, then one of the op like I'm in favor of giving kids choice. Like I'm against mm. the idea that in Canada, say in Vancouver, everyone has to learn French. Even though French mm -hmm. is an official language, the reality is they will probably not have much use for French. And if they're more motiv motivated to learn Chinese or Spanish, why wouldn't they be able to learn that language? The counter argument from the schools always is we don't have qualified <laughs> Uh, accredited teachers in that language and my answer always is there's so many resources available it doesn't matter if you have a motivated language coach who knows yep. how to help kids access all this stuff so what do they do in Britain how do they deal with this fact the kid says okay I want to learn Japanese and the school says we don't have a Japanese teacher then what that's pretty much what happens. So then, so then the kids won't get to learn Japanese. <laughs> you know, it, it is it is still that basis of, um, for example, my my partner is a primary school teacher, mm -hmm. and so they have French at their school. They have a French teacher who comes in, I think, one day a week and teaches each class one by one their French lesson for the week. Mm -hmm. And that's how that's just that's the way it goes. Um, you do get it may be that a teacher that already works at the school speaks. I don't know, or studied Latin, for example, mm -hmm. when they were at school 30, 40 years ago, and they go, oh, I've got some Latin, you know, and then that, they might teach Latin if mm -hmm. the school can't find an external teacher to, mm -hmm. to come in and do it. So there are occasions where it would vary like that, but it's very rare, I think, that the child would get the choice. Again, like you say, because but you of said that they lack do, of you said they were allowed teacher. to choose whatever they wanted. Oh no, the, the school, the school is allowed to choose. Oh, the school is allowed to choose. Mm -hmm. See, I'm again. It always annoys me that everything that happens in language learning is, is dictated by the teacher. Uh, yeah. Let's say that you had uh, a skill, like uh, within the teaching profession, you had people who knew where to find resources on the internet. Let's take Japanese. So there are going to be children in the UK who are interested in anime, who are interested in some aspect of Japanese culture, even at the age of 10. Those people exist. Mm -hmm. And so if initially, let's say that um, the initial course was to start to show them some of the things they can do in different languages, which might be Swahili, might be Japanese, might be uh, Russian, whatever. Uh, and then the kid says, I'm interested in Japanese. Then the teacher just say, well, here are some resources that you can use, that you can listen to, that you yes. can do stuff with. And maybe there's you have to pool 
uh, you know, the human resources within the teaching community so that uh, the teacher at school A is a coordinator, coach, motivator, but she's able to access some other more specific resources, Japanese language resources that are available in Yorkshire or, you know, somewhere that, mm. that somehow, because I come across this here again, if we don't have a teacher in our school who can teach Japanese, you can't have Japanese, which in today's day and age strikes me as very backward looking. I think that's a fantastic point. And I love that idea of having someone who gives the child the reason, because everything now is, is, it's so much easier, like you say, with the internet and everything. It's so easy as well for a child. A, a child picks up an, an iPad and they know exactly what to do with it. Yeah, exactly. You know? exactly. So if, you, if you've got a Japanese app installed on the iPad, the child is going to know exactly what to do mm. and they're going to learn Japanese. So, yeah, it, it is so easy. It should be. Yeah. <laughs> it should be the case that, right. that, you know, the child can say, I want to learn this language. I'm, I'm intrigued by that. You know, I love this aspect of that culture. I love that food or just something small that they've picked right. up on, even from a young age that they can then draw on and, and learn a language from. And I think I would like to think that that is something that will change. I mean, it's something I've always I've always felt like you asked at the beginning. Um, is it a case of the students in the UK are already there or am I kind of having to motivate? And I've always felt very passionate about the idea of inspiring language learning mm -hmm. with what I do um, and I hope that that comes across I hope mm -hmm. that that I that I do well you <laughs> know there's always this sort of dilemma on the one hand sort of the the learner-centered approach says that the kids or the learner not just kids should have the freedom to choose what to learn how to learn but the reality is that most people don't want that degree of freedom most people like to be directed so, and yes. yet if it's too, I always find like, as a learner, when the teacher here, you have to, you have to read this story, you know, and then you have to answer my questions on this story. And, and so everything we're dancing to the tune that's dictated by the teacher. So there, there has to be some kind of balance between freedom, allowing, you know, people being motivated by what interests them. And then, you know, the fact is that it's, it's like the teacher is a shepherd. Well, you have the, the you know, you have the laggards. So they need to be shepherded, you know, herded along with the others. So some kind of a more of a role of, of motivator, coordinator, providing some guidance and direction, but where possible, you know, allowing people to do what they what they want to do rather than forcing them, which gets me the subject of Esperanto. I'm not a fan of, uh, you know, some people say, well, if you learn Latin, then you can learn the other Romance languages. And I always say, well, why not start with Spanish? Because it's more interesting mm -hmm. than Latin for most people, unless you're interested in ancient Rome and uh, so I personally because I have yet to meet a, an Esperant you know a resident of Esperantia um, I'm more motivated to learn another language and then yeah. every with every language you learn of course you get better at learning languages so yeah. maybe Esperanto is faster but the effort you put into learning Spanish Russian Korean is also going to prepare you for then learning other languages so I think Esperanto should be part of the mix but I wouldn't like to see a situation where the school says, okay, in primary school, everyone does Esperanto because we think that's good. I would not be in favor of that. That's very interesting. And, you know, the only reason I learned Esperanto was I met some friends probably last year um, that spoke Esperanto. I then found a book la last year and I thought, oh, this is kind of falling into my lap. Yeah. And it was on Duolingo. And I was like, mm, let's give Duolingo a go. Let's see how this goes. And that was that was it. There was there was no. And but as I was going through the course, there were things like um, you know, I would I would like to order a pizza or whatever. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I would never be in a situation where I'm in a restaurant and me and a waiter or a waitress. The only common language I have is Esperanto. When's that going to happen? Because you know, it's like you say, there's you've yet to meet <laughs> meet a native speaker of, of Esperanto. And of course, there you know there are native speakers now. Uh, well probably not just now, probably over the past few decades even. But yeah, I did find that as I was working through, I'm thinking, this is cool and it's very interesting that I'm picking this up and it's a new language and, I'm, and it's happening so fast. But I couldn't see a, a, an opportunity in my life when I would use it, which was, which was curious. Well, I mean, for example, it depends how we're motivated. And I mean, if I hear a foreign language around me, my ears, you know, pick up and, and geez, I want to go over there and see if I can talk to them 
or if I'm on an airplane, I'm always hoping the person sitting beside me will be, you know, a speaker of some other language. And now, for example, with my Ukrainian, I've been listening to some really interesting stuff about Ukrainian history in Ukrainian. And I did the same with Polish and it doesn't matter, Chinese. I mean, when I started learning Chinese, you get involved in this whole phenomenal world of, of China and its history and stuff like that. So to that extent, you know, it may be that I could learn Esperanto very quickly, but I'm just not motivated. However, for those who are motivated, that's fine. All I'm saying is to impose that as the sort of all kids shall learn Esperanto in the primary school system, I would not be. Personally, I wouldn't think that mm. would be such a great idea, you know. I can, I can, I can see. I can yeah. see that. I can see why. Yeah. Now, let's move on a bit to, uh, by the way, uh, you have experienced Duolingo. Uh, you should get on Link sometime and work on your Korean, yes. for example. Uh, although Korean is a tough one on Link, because what I find so difficult in Korean is there's so many words that have so many different meanings. I looked them up in my neighbor dictionary, and I'm no further ahead. In fact, uh, I'm. Uh, we have a Korean girl in the office uh, for three months here. We have this Link Academy Live where we got a, um, a learner from Taiwan, a learner from Korea, and a learner from Hungary. And we're interacting with them and working on their English and stuff. And she's going to uh, help me with my Korean. And I've got a list of words that I've saved in Link where the dictionary, the neighbor, which is an excellent dictionary, provides no clue at all as to what the meaning is. Oh, wow. And I find that in other languages, the dictionary is pretty good. You know, depending on which language, you'll find the dictionary that you like the best. And we link up to it at Link. And I'm, I'm working my way through the text and I understand it. But Korean, to that extent, is... Is more more difficult. So, yeah, it is. It's yeah because you know you do feel that kind of well I've learned this language so now it's it's going to be easy from here on in. I've learned X right. number of languages so now yeah. you know I know what I'm doing now. But yeah, Korean has been interesting. I don't. I, I don't know. I don't. I'm, I'm wary to say the hardest language I've ever learned mm -hmm. because I always kind of hold that to German because at the time when I learned German everything before had been a romance language right. and then all of a sudden it was like cases and I'm thinking hang on a minute what is a case and it, it really took a long time for me to get my head around that concept um, but then once I got it it was easy so maybe in that sense Korean is now taking <laughs> taking over German as that right. title for me of the hardest one that I've, that I've uh, looked at. What, can but I ask what your motivation yeah. was to learn Korean? To learn Korean. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a friend, Shannon, um, who has a language blog, and we wanted to learn a language together. Mm -hmm. And she had some resources for Korean. I have ah. nothing. I ha I'm, I'm going completely from uh, sort of free resources that are available, whereas she's got some books and, and dictionaries and all of this stuff. So it's kind of this interesting contrast. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to learn it together. She lives in California, so right. on the other side of the world. So it's a nice way that we can right. um, connect and, and study together in that right, sense right right yeah. right right yeah i mean i in my career in the case of uh i mean we have some beginner material at link and then i went to talk to me in korean material mm. available are you familiar with talk to me in korean yes yeah, yeah. it's so good so i used a, a bunch of that now a lot of our members have contributed content in our library in korean and then uh as i advanced in korean i, I needed something a little more with some more substance so I found two podcasts, which I paid a lady to transcribe. So I'm now learning uh, from those, but they're just a little difficult for me. So I struggle to find something that's kind of intermediate, even slightly advanced intermediate and, and yet interesting. And so I think a large part of learning any language, if I like with Ukrainian, I found all this interesting stuff about Ukrainian history and the same with Russian and Czech and so forth. Mm. So part of it is finding interesting uh, material because that'll motivate you to fight your way through all the vagueness and uncertainty and stuff like that so. definitely yeah. definitely i think one of the one of the big mistakes i made was when i started japanese i started with a tutor straight away and it was a fantastic tutor i learned so much i was able to to kind of put together really kind of basic sentences and then questions and expanded and and a cheater. Very, very what's a cheater? sorry what's a cheater did you say? Oh, a, a, a tutor. <laughs> a tutor. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. sorry. I might okay. have said teacher. Teacher, tutor. Tutor. Sure. Okay. I heard the word yeah. cheater. I thought there's a new sort of hack for oh. learning language called a cheater. I thought, wow, I got to learn about this. No, no. I okay. Tutor. Sorry. Um, 
yeah, but so I thought with Korean, I thought I'll do the same thing. I'll get a tutor early on. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll get a sort of speaking. Da, 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 it will work. We spent about seven, eight lessons on pronunciation, and I was bored to tears. I'm yeah. I'm not someone that can study pronunciation mm-hmm. for a prolonged period of time. Right. So I, I made that mistake in that from the beginning, it became mm, not as fun. Right. So I had to then kind of almost shake things up and restart and make it fun and find things that, that did work for me. Mm-hmm. So I think I'm getting there now mm-hmm. in, see, in that sense. See, that's interesting. My approach is I'm going to have so much trouble pronouncing at the beginning that I don't worry about trying to pronounce or trying to say anything yeah. until my brain has become much more familiar with the language. Because the fact of the matter is we don't hear the pronunciation. We don't hear it. How can we possibly reproduce it if we can't hear it? And it's interesting. The reason I know we don't hear it is like one of the functions we have at Link is we have dictation, where if you save a bunch of phrases, you can then review these phrases uh, one by one in sort of cards and, and there's text to speech. So then you hear it and then you got to type it out in Polish. And what I thought I heard and what was actually said were two different things. So you, we really have to train ourselves to actually hear what's said, bef- uh, in my view, before we can hope to be able to pronounce it. And so once we hear it better, then we have a better chance of pronouncing it correctly. So normally I will don't even I don't even worry about pronunciation until several months. And and don't I don't really worry that much about output until I have built up a certain amount of vocabulary. And to that extent, even the cases, say with German or Russian, there's normally the, there's a sort of a, a redundancy of words. So that in most situations, you can figure out the meaning like 70%, 80% clearly, somewhat vaguely, without really being able to nail the cases. And so you can mm. read stuff. It has meaning. It's interesting, more or less. And then once certain phrases, you become familiar with certain patterns, you then go back in and really try to understand how the cases work. You now have some experience. You have something to refer to. Otherwise, you start from ground zero and you're trying to remember case endings and stuff like that. So I find I always start, to my mind, I think the emphasis on output, pronunciation, all those things too early. In fact, for me at any rate, is unnecessary pressure. And so I prefer to sort of get it in, get it in. And now, okay, now I'm ready to really go for output and yeah. pronunciation. It is, it is a pressure. And I think it's the pressure that easily can floor you. Because if, you know, if you're really trying and you're really good, and then you just can't, because like you say, you can't hear it in those early stages, then why would you carry on, right? So yeah. I, I think, think yeah, I, I, yeah, I do prefer that idea of almost the the input, the sort of absorbing the language and kind of getting familiar and then gaining confidence with, with that. It's quite refreshing to hear I mean, someone else. <laughs> yeah, and, and people underestimate the difficulty of remembering things. People think that because I remember, okay, I learned how to say buenos dias, uh, uh, you know, como esta usted, como estas, that I'm going to remember, and I can say it once or twice. Then when I'm all, re- all of a sudden confronted with someone where I have to say even the most basic things like buenos dias, como estas, all of a sudden I'm frozen. We, f- we, d- we underestimate how, and that's just something very simple like, hello, how are you? It's so difficult to remember things. In fact, my view is that we don't remember them. We gradually get used to them. And so try, and I see so many people who've been, say, friends of mine who've been studying Spanish, and they still can't get past the most basic sort of phrases and expressions because all they're trying to do is to train themselves to produce these phrases. Uh, whereas if they devoted the same amount of time and effort into, say, initially getting to a stage where they could actually read a novel in, in say, Spanish, and there's, you know, you, there's lots of tremendous audio books, and then... I mean, we use Link to access the text, but they can use, you know, online dictionaries. They can import these as ebooks. There's so many different ways that you can engage with the content and just have this very pleasant, uh, you know, involvement with the language. And, and then at a certain point, you say, okay, now I'm going to go after, you know, speaking. Cause, and then you've got some, some point of reference, some experience, some confidence, comprehension. Like, how can you even talk to someone if you don't understand what they're saying, you know? So that's why I'm kind of that way oriented rather than mm. hoping in a short time like Korean. I mean, you can go at Korean for a year before you start speaking because I find it very difficult to understand people. 
uh, with far less effort in Ukraine. I can listen to a Ukrainian history professor talk about uh, what happened a million years ago. And uh, in Korean, there people are saying stuff that I know, and I can't pick it out. Yeah, so. it's, it's true. And, and um, I think as well, like, there was, some, there was a point you said, and I had a really, I really wanted to say something, and it's completely gone from my mind. Um, think about it. I've forgotten. I've forgotten. Okay. <laughs> it will come back to me. All right. So, yeah, but at any rate, the main thing is to motivate people. So, uh, just a quick question here, because it's very topical. Brexit. Now, sitting here in Canada, we have this impression of a country that's basically split down the middle. And and those people who voted correct. to leave, despite all that, you hear so-and-so is having buyer's remorse and they're, they were lied to and stuff. I don't believe that. I think that the majority of those people who voted to leave want to leave. And so even though there might be a million people in Trafalgar Square and five million people who signed a petition, basically we got, if there's however many, 60 million people in the UK, they don't all vote, but 30 million people want to leave and 30 million people want to stay. How does... Or to to what extent does any of this affect interest in language learning? That's a very good question, and I think it's it's difficult because for me, in my kind of social sphere, if you like, I guess I was in this bubble before it happened, where everyone, you know, most of my my friends and acquaintances are quite sort of language orientated and quite internationally orientated. Right. So I was seeing all of this huge support for Remain. And then the very occasional silly news story related to the Leave Party, you know, like, oh, their, their bus and all the lies on their bus and all of these, these silly stories. And you think, oh, my goodness, this is ridiculous. They're never going to win. And then you see the, the polls coming up and it gets close and you think, oh, hang on a minute. Surely not this many people can disagree. And, you know, you, you do feel very strongly about the idea that I'm right and they're wrong. And mm -hmm. of course, that's not necessarily the case, but you, it, it built this huge tension that I think is still, still present after the result, definitely. But it's made me very much, it made me realize something about my, myself, my own language learning that I'd like to mention first. It made me realize that if there's one reason, if someone said to me, name one reason why you learn languages, it would be tolerance. It would be, to understand people, to understand other people that are different to me, and it gives me a level of tolerance towards them. And and it, this whole Brexit thing has made me realise that, which I'm grateful for. But I do think that, you know, obviously this vote is representative of how our country feels, whether or not, like you say, people are having the buyer's remorse and they're feeling like, oh, I should have voted to remain and I voted leave. I didn't think this would happen. It is representative that there are a percentage there, there is a percentage of this country that do feel a strong desire to, quote unquote, make Britain great again and take our country back. And I think by that, there is a feeling of English. English, English is the language. And of course, this, this alone in itself isn't true. Even if you take immigration out of the question, the, the, the British Isles is a multilingual nation. You know, we, we have multiple languages that are spoken um natively to 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 this 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 land so but again i think that's unrecognized like cornwall and wales received a lot of eu funding a lot of support as well in terms of language rights what happens now to 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 those languages that were getting support from the eu that's that's one side of of the the language uh, effects of, of Brexit. The other side that's now beginning to come out is will English be an official language within the EU if Britain leaves? And I think the answer to that is yes, because you've got countries like Ireland and Malta where English is um, quite quite prominent. Um, but you know this is this has been questioned, so it will have an effect on a on a wide scale. But I think in terms of individual language learning, I would like to think that it would encourage people to their languages to think with with as perhaps not even as a result of Brexit but as a result of the even more recent kind of um, racial tensions that seem to have appeared since the result which I think is horrific maybe people are now beginning to feel we need to be united with with as as 
native Brits, as people that are immigrants to this land, that, that live alongside us and contribute to our society. We need to unite with people. Maybe that will have a positive effect and it will inspire people to pick up languages, to learn community languages, even mm-hmm. more so perhaps. But then, of course, as I said, there is a percentage of the of the Leave supporters that I believe don't feel that way and very, very strongly don't feel that way. But I don't think that Brexit has impacted their thoughts. I think they have possibly for a long time felt that same way and felt that, you know, English only and and, and this is this is our land, you speak English, you know. You know so in- there are some various points. There's some interesting contradictions. You mentioned Cornwall and Wales, and I've been following it. And both Cornwall and Wales, have not, if I'm not mistaken, voted quite heavily in favour of leave. Yeah, yeah. And, and though, since Cornwall, I mean, within a day, two days, we're saying, we still want our funding. It's like, well, hang on a minute. Well, yeah, they want their funding, but for a variety of things, not necessarily just for language. But it's interesting of that course. those are two areas of the UK with more so in Wales than in Cornwall, but that have a, a still surviving, call it, regional language, uh, they uh, voted to leave. Uh, Another interesting thing is there's over a million Brits who live uh, on the continent, retired or otherwise, or who have homes there. Yes. And a very small minority of those actually bother learning French or Spanish. So those are people who actually have an opportunity, like day-to-day exposure to the language that surrounds them. And they still live in their little island. That's... I would say that's where the attitude comes in of, oh, well, if I'm going to live in Spain, then I'll pick it up. Right. I feel like there's there's a certain level of that, especially especially if, if people aren't used to language learning and they're not kind of obsessed like, <laughs> like we are. Like we are, then yeah. It might be a case of, oh, well, if I go and live in a country, I'm going to learn a language. I won't need to make an effort, which, you know, of course, is, is incorrect. I think that's a very important point. Something that maybe in a subsequent uh, discussion we could get into is, People underestimate how much, I wouldn't say effort, like it's effort, yeah, it's time, it's commitment. How much is involved in learning a language? And we have the same here amongst immigrants who, in many cases, whatever level of English they arrive with, that's about what they'll have after three or four or five years. Mm. Especially within certain groups where there are a lot of them, like the Chinese, for example. Obviously, if you are Albanian, there's not too many Albanians here, so you're going to have to learn English. But if you're Chinese, you can live in Chinese. And so then the, the attitude is, well, once I get a job, uh, you know, then I'll learn. But in fact, they don't, A, don't get a very good job because they can't speak English very well. And then, in fact, their language basically plateaus. And, and I've seen this, like I know people, not only Brits, you know, Swedes and others who live in Spain or in France. And they kind of half sort of feel they should try to learn, but then they go off and play golf and then they don't worry about it. And they think they kind of can pick it up. Uh, and then they, they can order food in a restaurant so they're happy. So, yeah, the, the thing is it does take a lot of deliberate effort. It takes a strategy. Uh, it, you have to find out what resources are there. You need. That's where I think, again, I get back to this idea of language coaches, not only in schools, but even, in, even for you know, lifelong learners, people like you who can advise people, direct them to the appropriate resources, motivate them, that's almost more important than finding a tutor in, uh, you know, Toulouse or, uh, you know, Malaga. Uh, you'll go yeah. a few times and then you lose interest and you won't learn much. So I, I, I'm a big believer in this language coach, familiar with resources, who could recommend a strategy, keep people motivated, and then people have to go and, and, and do it, basically. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, like I said, I, I teach um, online and a huge part I see of my job is also look we're together for one hour a week you're not going to learn Spanish you're not going to learn French in a year you know you need to also put in your own time and your own effort and you know sometimes it works and sometimes a student will be committed they will make real progress sometimes it doesn't and you know you can you can generally tell um quite early on because it's it's a level of motivation that you can sense and you have to you know I'll often work with students and kind of and, and guidance and say look here are some great resources you can use in the week you know we've got some vocab we've learned today put this into sentences put it and right. you know in your own time set some time aside each day so that you're you're keeping this up and it's not just because I think as well the the, the risk is 
and I've definitely been guilty of this too. When you get a tutor, you almost like, okay, I've logged onto Skype, I've pressed call, right, teach me. Exactly. <laughs> you sort of almost sit back and expect them to just tell you and absorb. Nope, not going to happen. No, and, and worse than that, not only do the, does the learner become passive saying, teach me, the learner says, okay, I've spent the money, I've devoted an, an hour a week, so I've done my Where thing. Where are the results? So I can yes. kick that off. I'm, st I'm learning Spanish. Okay, now I can go on and do so something else. Uh, I was once at a conference in Germany uh, it was called uh, Sprache und Beruf, like language, language and, and professions. And there was a survey done of people who were studying English, let's say, in German companies, because the German employer, they spent a lot of money on language training. And they found that on average, the amount of time per week that the professional sort of employee learner spends on language learning outside the hour of instruction was one and a half hours a week. Now, in my experience of learning languages, one and a half hours a week is not enough to, to really make any progress whatsoever. So, so the, yeah. I guess your job and mine is to motivate people to put in more than an hour and a half a week into learning their languages if they want to get there. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, well, maybe yeah. we should, uh, we could probably talk for hours, but um, <laughs> we're already at 36 minutes. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff there. So I'm going to shut off the recorder and we can have a few more minutes of, of discussion if you Okay. Time. So thank, thank you, thank you and thank you for all of those <laughs> listening. And I will leave a link to Lindsay Does Languages in the description box. Bye. Bye. Thank you.